Good afternoon, and welcome to this edition of HDSA and Me. Today, we welcome Dr. Suman Jort J. Dev from our HDSA Center of Excellence at the University of Washington in Seattle. You can send a question at any time during this presentation. Just click on the chat function in the toolbar, type your question, and hit enter. Your question will be answered at the end of the session. This presentation will be available in about a week on HDSA's YouTube channel. On April 29th, Dr. Jackie Bainbridge from the HDSA Center of Excellence at the University of Colorado will join us to talk about medications and supplements, how to prepare for your next clinic visit. You can register for this session by going to hdsa.org forward slash hdsa hyphen me. And now a little about our speaker. Dr. Suman Jayadev is the director of the University of Washington HDSA Center of Excellence and is a board certified neurologist. He's an associate professor in neurology and adjunct in internal medicine. She completed a neurology residency followed by fellowship in neurogenetics and neuroinflammation at the University of Washington. Dr. Jayadev has been working with HD patients and families since 2006. He is dedicated to promoting the well being of her patients from all aspects and also directs research into the basic mechanisms of neurodegenerative diseases. We are delighted to welcome her here today, and I'll now turn the broadcast over to Dr. Suman Jayadev. Thank you, Deb. And uh, thank you everyone for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Um, and like Deb said, I'm at the University of Washington in Seattle, uh, where we have a center of excellence and we follow a few hundred people a year. And uh, so what I was gonna do is talk about <clears throat> broadly what we call pelvic organ dysfunction. And I wanted to talk about it today because it's one of those things that we see affecting a lot of our patients and their families' lives. And um, so we've spent some time thinking about it. So I was gonna share that with you. And just uh, go ahead and put your questions in the chat. And the great thing about the chat is that you write it and then no one forgets the question. That always happens to me. I think of a question I don't remember. So put it in the chat and we'll have plenty of time to talk about it um, later. So when we talk about symptoms of Huntington's disease and we're teaching it to medical students, we're teaching it to the residents, we talk about these three aspects of HD. There's the movement aspect, involuntary movements, difficulty with coordination, dystonia, balance problems. We talk about the cognition, um, difficulty with judgment and multitasking. We talk about psychiatric symptoms depression, obsessive behavior, severe agitation, um, disinhibition, which is also cognitive and, and even sometimes psychotic behavior with hallucinations. Those are essentially the triad of Huntington's disease. But you know what we all know is that there are other features of HD that are uh, important and really influence our lives like any other symptom. And those are, include things like body temperature dysregulation, loss of bowel and bladder control, changes to sleep patterns, changes to weight. And we know that that weight situation, losing weight is not simply a matter of too much movement causing weight loss. It really is a metabolic, um, uh, a metabolic um, uh, consequence, metabolic hypothalamic. We're actually still trying to understand the biology behind it, but nevertheless, weight loss is a big problem. So when we talk to people in our clinic, th these are things that we hear. So we think we hear things like, he just keeps taking off his pants in the adult family home. They're getting really tired of it and I don't know how to change it. Or she comes to clinic, we see her, she's wearing a t-shirt and it's you know 40 degrees outside and her husband's saying, she just refuses to wear the jacket. We had a big fight about it. I try to keep it on and she won't do it. Um, we have people saying, he's just going to the bathroom all the time. We sit down to watch television. He keeps going up. I don't know what's going on. I think he's just getting stuck on having to use the restroom. I don't think he even does anything when he goes in there. We've had people tell us about constipation, diarrhea, and then back and forth, alternating diarrhea, constipation. How do you get a handle on it? Um, and then we also hear not very often, but when we um, have conversations with some, with some people, there are um, changes to intimacy with your with their partner that they notice and it's something that they think about we don't really talk about but it's it's there so 
when we talk about quality of life broadly, um, we there are ways that we try and objectively measure it. So you may have seen in studies, uh, there's a quality of life survey. There are different groups that have different quality of life. I think, so in the Huntington's disease quality of life or one of the Huntington's disease quality of life surveys, it tries to cover a broad aspect of life. And so for instance, um, if you break them down into different domains, quality of life surveys where they ask people, fill this survey out and tell us about these issues so that we can then as doctors quantify you know, what, what the quality of life is. We ask things like physical and functional changes. Are you having more difficulty carrying things? Are you having more trouble with your balance? Do you feel like you can't do, you know, you can do fewer jobs around the house? Do you have difficulty operating the television? These are basic activities that help us know or, you know, give us a sense of how your regular daily life is affected. We can do the same thing with cognition, challenges with cognition, challenges with everyday memory, following a conversation. These are like practical manifestations of the symptoms that we just talked about in the few slides earlier. We know we can talk about cognition, but how does it really manifest in your life? It manifests with difficulty talking to your neighbor and remembering what they said. Same thing with mood. Difficulty with motivation and apathy can really interfere with your social interactions. Um, depressed mood can change your relationship with your family and friends. Um, irritability in the same way. And then symptoms like that, that affect you know, your sense of worry. So are, are, you, are you having trouble with financial, um, your financial situation? Are you worried about the support for yourself or support for your family? So when we look at these quality of life surveys, we thought you know, there's aspects here that we don't necessarily cover. Um, and so for instance, those questions that we just talked about, how does it affect your daily life and your partner's daily life when you've got to go to the bathroom all the time? You know, it certainly affects your your social self, it affects the way you want to, you, you feel comfortable leaving your house, it affects the relationship with your family, it affects your comfort um, and mood. So um, what we did in our center was decide, was um, spend some time trying to delve into that with our folks and uh, learn a bit more about um, pelvic symptoms and uh, whether or not there were things that we could do to intervene and make things better. So here's the outline of what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to do a brief, um, a brief explanation or, or just a general idea about how the brain can control different aspects of pelvic function. Um, we'll talk about bladder and bowel and sex. And then I will just say a word about that sensation of being overheated and just some, some things that we've been doing. So let's think back about hunting. You know, when you, talk about Huntington's disease. Remember, it used to be called Huntington's Korea, and that's because there was just more uh, awareness about the motor symptoms. And so if you look at the brain here, um, Huntington's disease is a motor syndrome. You can um, uh, pinpoint to the area of the brain that controls movement. So the basal ganglia, that um, aspect of the brain is severely affected by Huntington's disease. It's the area that shrinks, that you see um, atrophying. And that area controls intentional movement, uh, involuntary movement, et cetera. It can cause rigidity. But we um, soon became uh, a little more sophisticated with our uh, description of Huntington's disease symptoms and um, started talking about it more as a motor psychiatric and cognitive disease. This is a picture from the European Huntington Network. Um, and so what we see is that actually there are many parts of the brain that are involved. There's the frontal cortex, and that's the part that has to do with executive function and decision making and multi-multitasking. Um, multi, uh, and then there's the, the other um, parietal and, and other areas of the brain that affect um, psychiatric and cognitive changes. And all of these features um, are influenced by molecules, neurotransmitters, and those neurotransmitters are affected in Huntington's disease. So it gives us an idea that there's a physiological basis behind some of these other symptoms of Huntington's disease that we know. Now, more recently, there's been um, a fair amount of work uh, about the way Huntington's disease can affect the autonomic system. 
So uh, this is a picture of what the autonomic system is. And what it means is it is a description of the nerve system that controls all these things that we don't even think about. How your eye constricts, so right here, um, how much saliva you've got, your heart rate, um, how well your stomach is moving food through. Um, it affects the way that your intestines move or don't move and it affects uh, your bladder. And there are two sides to the autonomic, well, functionally there's two sides that I'm showing you here to the autonomic system, the parasympathetic and the sympathetic system. And this is also what we sometimes call the fight or flight response. So all these things are happening behind the scenes. Your body's doing this automatically. And what we're finding is that in Huntington's disease, there is a change to the regulation of this autonomic system. And in that setting, you end up also influencing some of these, um, some of these systems like your intestines, your bladder. Um, the hypothalamus is a part of the brain right here that regulates the autonomic system. And the hypothalamus also regulates things like temperature, et cetera. So um, a lot of important basic body functions um, that can be influenced by Huntington's disease. Um, there was a study a number of years ago that tried to quantify whether there are autonomic changes um, with Huntington's disease. And so this was a paper that came out a while ago. And basically what, what they wanted to show on the y-axis was a measure of autonomic function. The higher on the axis, the better. And then on the x-axis is the measure of someone's um, motor difficulty related to Huntington's disease. And so the bigger the number here, the more trouble they had. And what you see is that as people get more symptomatic with Huntington's disease, their autonomic function worsens. That was one study and you know we're still trying to gather the information about it, but a number of other studies have tried to look at this. Now really recently, within this month, um, the group in Iowa that's been studying kids at risk had a really interesting study. And so they had, uh, I think about 200 kids that were gene negative and their average age was maybe like 11 or 12 years old. And they had about 84 kids that were gene positive. And what they did was look at the heart rate, the core body temperature and blood pressure. So these are measures of autonomic function. They looked at those in kids and then tried to see if there was a correlation between how far they were out from being symptomatic with Huntington's disease. That's what this year to onset is and whether or not there's a correlation between that and some of these autonomic readouts. And what they find is, so here's the gene negative group and they have some measure of core body temperature here. And as they get, as the kids who are the same age, but are closer to their predicted year of age of onset, they have a slightly higher temperature. They have a slightly higher heart rate. And what this suggests is, what this suggests is that the process of Huntington's disease itself, even before you're symptomatic, may influence the way your body is regulating some of these basic functions. Um, and that's important because if this is a physiological thing that we can understand better, maybe we can intervene better. So when we talk about pelvic organ function, and I should tell you, I never talked about pelvic organ function. It still sounds a little funny to me and I feel like giggling when I say it, but uh, Brenda is a, our, our Huntington's disease nurse um, has been working with um, neuro, urological, so, so the neurological aspects to bowel and bladder. She's been doing it for 10, 20 years, and so she's very comfortable talking about this. But when we talk about pelvic organ function, we're talking about bladder, bowel, and sexual function. And the fact is that many patients with neurological diseases have these types of dysfunction. And that includes not only HD, that includes Parkinson's, so the you know, neurodegenerative diseases, <clears throat> it includes people with strokes. So all across the, the gamut, because like we just showed or talked about, um, the brain and the nervous system you know, controls all these things. And bowel bladder issues can really have a huge impact on the way people lead their lives. So if you have trouble with your bladder, you really don't wanna go out. If you have trouble with your bowel, it can be really, uh, it can cause pain. Again, it can be it can be embarrassing if you if you have difficulty controlling it, um, and then those have subsequent consequences. It affects your 
sense of dignity, it affects your mood, et cetera. So to us, um, this is a really important aspect to quality of life. And the important thing is that we can treat many of these. And so we want to be able to talk about them. So what we did was um, we put together a survey that tried to incorporate previously um, uh, validated questions about the three, bladder, bowel, and sex. Um, and here's just an example of some of the questions that we ask. And so for instance, if we're asking about difficulty emptying your bladder, we'll say, you know, we'll say, do you have the feeling that your bladder was not empty after urinating? We ask these questions. Um, we have people answer them. We had 22 questions about the bladder, 11 questions about bowel, and 11 questions about sex. We did this on about 50 people in the clinic. Um, we just basically started and then asked anyone who came in, you know, would you be willing to, to take the survey? And like the HD community always is, everyone was um, uh, very interested in participating and contributing to this research. So that was just a fantastic, um, that was gr great participation. Um, so what we found was um, people, uh, of all the people that we asked, 40% of them had symptoms in all three of these domains, bladder, bowel, and sexual. Um, only about 25% of people had symptoms in, in only one. So the idea is really that these symptoms can often occur together. Um, and then the other big take home is that um, people with longer disease um, usually had more symptoms, which is not surprising, but something to note. So what does the brain do specifically with the bladder? So there are two major ways we can think about it. One is that the brain controls the filling or the storage phase. And so um, it allows the bladder to continue to expand, to get urine in, and then tells, you know, tells the rest of the body, okay, well, now it's time to get rid of it, get rid of the urine. It also controls the way in which we release urine. So it the actual urination process. Now that emptying piece is usually not so much of an issue for our patients. You don't usually have a lot of urine left in the bladder after people um, try and urinate. The problem is usually this other part, which is that there is this constant, um, this the signal from the brain to the bladder is always that your bladder's full, your bladder's full, your bladder's full. And so you, instead of having this normal full bladder, and then that's when your brain says, okay, time to empty. Even when your bladder is not completely full, you're getting this information that says, oh, bladder's full. And so you got to urinate, you got, you know, you got to get rid of it. And that bladder behavior is that's what we call neurogenic bladder. You may have heard that um, or see it on the, you know, the internet um, or your doctor may call about, may talk about it that way. So neurogenic bladder is basically a, a loss of the nervous system control of the bladder in order to form properly. So the symptoms are, um, and this is that this list is is sort of in a um, in order of of how often we saw it in people and how this has been discussed previously. So um, most often people have urinary incontinence or leaking, and there are different ways that you can have incontinence. You know, um, women that have had a number of pregnancies, they can have what's called stress incontinence, where um, the problem is really at the the strength of um, keeping the sphincter closed, um, and it just sort of leaks out. Urinary incontinence that 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 um, we have with Huntington's disease is really more about the tone of the bladder. Then there's urgency, and urgency is that sensation of needing to use the restroom right now. Can't wait immediately. People can have increased frequency, which is needing to go to the restroom all the time, and so. Um, that's a very intrusive problem to have. Uh, people have difficulty having to urinate at night and that's what's called nocturia and that's defined as needing to urinate more than uh, two or more times. That's disruptive for obvious reasons. And you gotta get up, it wakes up everybody else. And then what is most concerning is that, you know, you wake up and you um, need to use the restroom in the middle of the night, it's dark. This is where falls happen. Um, this is where people can get really injured is in that process of having to address problems with bladder in the middle of the night. And then sometimes people can have hesitancy, just difficulty initiating the stream. It's less common, but it can happen. So like I said, the most common um, symptom is really urinary incontinence or leakage. And so the treatments 
can be quite helpful. Um, we are, Brenda likes to say, we can be very successful with treatments. Um, and these are all uh, prescription medicines. And so, um, but the medicines can help both that sense of urgency, it can help that um, frequency and uh, nighttime, um, the need to use the restroom in the nighttime. So for those, we would say, talk to your primary care. They're often a, a, a good place to start and talk to your neurologist. You know, of course, HD is not the only reason why people may have a bladder problems. So we generally want to make sure there's nothing else going on first before you start treating a neurogenic bladder. And there are different ways that um, neurologists or even urologists will evaluate problems like that. Um, and the, the mechanism of these meds are really basically just to tone down that message to the bladder so that you can go from this really restricted bladder to a more relaxed one give you time to get to the restroom. Um, and then beyond medications for bladder symptoms, it's important to remember that diapers and pads can be quite effective. It allows people to go out and enjoy, you know, go uh, you know, outside the home, especially now when it may be more difficult to, to get out and find a public restroom, et cetera. Um, people people um, can benefit from those and it's a nice, a nice thing to keep in mind. Um, you know, I don't, we don't ever suggest this to people um, unnecessarily or, or unless they've asked us, but um, if people are say in an adult family home or have really severe um, uh, motor limitations, sometimes they will use a condom catheter, which is basically, um, it's just a way to collect the urine without going directly into the urethra, but it's just a, like a condom that has a tube collected to it. Um, connected to it, and um, men can sometimes wear those, and that's okay if that's okay if 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 um if people need that. Uh, we really try to avoid the indwelling catheters, which is the catheter that goes into into the urethra. Those are always a possible source of infection, et cetera. And because you have non-invasive ways to deal with it, we um, that that we we try to avoid it. So the bowel. Just like there's neurogenic bladder, there's neurogenic bowel, and uh, that's when the, the loss of control from the brain on the bowel can lead to um, poor movement of the rest of the gut, so constipation. Um, it can also lead to incontinence, and again, the control of this whole system, sort of multifactorial, like with the bladder, it can control the way the intestines are moving. Your, your nervous system also controls the way the, the actual act of um, getting rid of the stool uh, happens. So, the, but the typical symptoms we see here in, in patients are constipation, less frequently chronic diarrhea, um, often uh, incontinence and accidents. Again, it's that problem of just trying to get to the restroom in time. This sensation of early abdominal fullness. And so that again, it's another autonomic function um, and uh, it, can impair people's interest in eating. And then that feeling that one hasn't completely emptied. So um, for bowel problems, the treatments are generally over the counter, but again, because there are other reasons why you might have trouble with constipation and, and significant reasons why you might have diarrhea, it's always first, always good to first talk to your doc um, and uh, make sure there's uh, nothing else that needs to be evaluated. Um, after that's been done in our setting, we have a plan A, which is just to try an over-the-counter stool softener. Um, we try, uh, and there can be rectal stimulants. So these are things just to keep things moving. Uh, we always say, you know, increase your fiber. Um, and then uh, you can try to titrate your stool softeners, et cetera, to see uh, when it's effective. Um, and then the other piece of it that, again, is, is complicated enough that it's worth talking to your doctor, but we wanted to share with you is that sometimes these plans may work to treat constipation. And when they do, you don't want to just stop it. You want to think about how to incorporate some of these changes on a daily basis so that you can maintain a regular, um, regular bowel system. If none of that works, we will sometimes uh, recommend a suppository, and uh, those can be quite effective. And after that, I think it's important to talk to someone. Um, there are more uh, advanced um, methods to deal with constipation, but again, that's that's better done with um, supervision by your doc and or at least conversation with your doc. Um, for diarrhea, that's another one where 
you know, because diarrhea can be infectious or structural, it's always good to um, talk to your doc first. Um, but in the clinic, after we feel like there's no other illness, there's nothing else going on, uh, we will, you can just use Imodium. And that can be helpful. It can be helpful when you know that you know, you, you're concerned about going out and leaving your home, like a planned outing. Um, and so you can plan that ahead, take it, and then, um, and then feel a little more comfortable. What's important to know about diarrhea too is that it sometimes diarrhea can be sort of a secondary um, consequence of constipation itself because there's stool in the colon that's hard uh, and then the other stool is just coming out kind of leaking around it. So the only stuff that's coming out is the stuff that's leaking. And so it may look like diarrhea, but it's actually related to constipation. So, you know, it's not always as straightforward as, as you may think. Um, and I, like I've said already, you know, there are such huge consequences to untreated bowel and bladder. So there is that social isolation. We have so many people that are just reluctant to leave their houses um, and, or go out with friends. It can be so frustrating. Um, it can cause depression for many reasons. I mean, you're, you're just not being interactive. You're not being social. You feel like your life is just tied down to trying to deal with these symptoms. And importantly, it's also, um, it can be a real challenge to caregivers. And um, sometimes uh, trouble with this level of care is, is one of those things that um, causes families to think about, HD patients and their families to think about whether or not it's time to um, find different placement, just because the, the caregiving involved can be quite, um, can, be, can be a lot. And, bowel bladder dysfunction itself can sometimes serve as a seed for perseveration. And so, um, so it's always, you know, something to think about. Um, so do you treat the bowel and bladder or the perseveration? And what I'm talking about is, you know, people that just keep going to the restroom every 10 minutes and is it, are they perseverating on this concept? Do they really have this kind of problem? And so what we do is we say, first, let's just treat the, treat the bladder. Let's just assume that this behavior is related to um, problems with bladder. Um, see if any of this is effective, the bladder meds or a bowel program. And um, if it is effective, great. Um, sometimes we will do this in combination with thinking about treating perseveration OCD if there's evidence of it happening elsewhere, you know, if there's other other aspects of, of their life or stuff they talk about that seems like this may be a, a, a general problem. But um, oftentimes when we address the bowel bladder function, the perseveration of the problem improves. Um, so here's just an example um, where it can make a difference. So we have a 45 year old woman, um, she had stopped working um, and was living with her husband. It's just the two of them at home. And her husband was still working out of the home, but, but she was no longer. She was very active though. And so she walked every day. She went and she met with her sister at this outdoor cafe, like every other day. Um, just really enjoyed being out and about. She would go to the library, et cetera. But at some point after a few years of this and things are going really well, she started telling her husband that she was worried about going out because she just, she might not be able to find a restroom. And she would be afraid to go out. She stopped going out because she was worried about whether or not she would be in a place where there was no restroom. And it was hard to tease out if that was just a fear, if there was if that was based on something. Um, and she started doing this at home too, going to the restroom frequently. And um, so he had said, you know, is she just obsessing about going to the bathroom? She just goes in there and doesn't do anything. So what we did was begin a bladder medicine. And uh, a month later, he wrote back and said, she's doing so much better. She feels more relaxed and she's not talking about it constantly. Um, and in the end, she was more willing to go out. I mean, it was still tough. I think um, you know, she still had concerns, but, but it was something that at least improved her quality of life. And so we chalked it up to success. Sex. Um, so you know, why talk about sex in a neurological lecture? Um, it's because we know that um, difficulty with physical and cognition and cognitive uh, function um, can interfere with people's ability to express their sexuality and, and, and um, it's okay for people to, to 
talk about difficulties with expressing sexuality. It's okay to do it, but we don't do it very often. Um, and it can be really uh, an, another important aspect to uh, quality of life. And this will be quality of life for both the patient and the partner. And you know, often it's not so much that the act of sex has been, um, you know, has changed in such a way that the patient is very upset or the partner is very upset. What it is is really more about the intimacy of their relationship. Um, and so that's something, again, that we don't necessarily talk about, but it's happening in the background. And so we, you know, as a clinic, we wanted to just be aware and let patients know that we're aware and that, you know, we can always um, figure out ways to talk about it. But it is, we'd say, you know, underrecognized and not discussed as frequently in, in HD. Um, and when we talk to people about what it was that was um, important to them, or, you know, what did they feel um, they wanted to make sure we knew it was that uh, the contributing factors to the sexual dysfunction was really about their own health. Sometimes it was the health of their partner, um, sometimes, but less frequently, it was about conflict. And sometimes it was about loss, just loss of privacy because there are more people in the home and, or, or they weren't at home any longer. Um, both men and women reported the same level of dysfunction. Um, and like I said, it's a lot of it's about intimacy. Uh, you know, as many of you know, another sort of intersection between sex and HD is that a lot of the medicines we use to treat HD have sexual side effects. And so, um, you know, and that's another thing that you can always talk to your physicians about. Uh, there are certain um, antidepressants that may not have the same sexual side effects. Some of those, though, can be kind of activating and sometimes can increase anxiety. And so those are things to, to think about. And then, of course, um, and this is not related to the autonomic dysfunction that we're talking about, but there is this um, question of some individuals having hypersexuality, and that's really a psychiatric issue. And, and treatment for that is, again, um, is can be SSRIs, neuroleptics. We treat this like a behavior. Um, OK, so just a little word about overheated. Um, and so again, this is one of those things that uh, we note anecdotally. People come in, they're not wearing the jacket, they say they're hot. And then a lot of times it's people that are so uncomfortable, they're complaining about being too hot. And so what we um, use are a range of the or, um, these cooling vests. Here's just a picture of um, one. This one probably cost about $50 or so, but there's a range of costs and we can always help you find ones that are less expensive. Some of them, you know, you just it's just cooling, um, cooling stuff you put in the sleeve and a little packets you put in the freezer and then you take them out and put them in the vest. Um, we've had patients that have really uh, done well with them. In fact, I think we may have even heard about it first from one of the patients who found it and then told, taught us about it. Um, and then if people don't want to wear a coat, that's okay. You know, you, you want to make sure no one gets frostbite, but just appreciate that, um, that they are very likely just biologically overheated. And so it's reasonable to think about what clothing choices would make them more comfortable. We have another person who's been getting in trouble because he really just kept taking his, kept taking his pants off at the adult family home and they were really upset about it. Um, but it turns out it's just because he was hot. And so, um, you know, making sure people have shorts available, et cetera. Just remember, um, as I'm sure you all are aware that um, heating can be an issue. There are different reasons people have thought about. One of the folks that, um, one of the scientists that used to be here had done some work um, when he was with um, Alice Spada's group, who was a Huntington researcher. And they had looked at the way Huntington affects the biology of mitochondria and had shown that um, changes to the mitochondria function and the mitochondria are the little energy organelles of the cell. Um, caused you to release heat. And so it may, so that was one metabolic way. And then like we talked about earlier, the um, hypothalamus itself, which is a part of the brain that can be affected, can regulate temperature. So a lot of different reasons. I don't think it's quite clear why, but the management at least is fairly certain. So the conclusions are um, Huntington's can impact these things, bowel, bladder, temperature, sexual function, um, swallowing, all of these um, features of our body that uh, we don't necessarily think about um, as often. 
and we have medications for many of them, which is, um, which is uh, great for quality of life. And um, there are non-medication methods to try. But we would say in general, talk to your team about it. You know, it's part of HD and uh, we wanna make sure that, I mean, all of us wanna make sure that we can help maintain quality of life, improve quality of life as much as possible. And so this would be another way in which we can talk about that. So that's, um, that's what I came to talk to you about <clears throat> uh, lecture format. And um, so we thank you all and wish everybody the best for 2021 and beyond. And so here's our folks. Um, it looks like it was taken by a drone and was someone <clears throat> standing up higher above us. And so um, many of you will recognize this face, Dr. Tom Bird, Susan Reynolds, our social worker who you probably have seen at various conventions. Brenda Vickers is our nurse here. You probably have also seen in conventions and then our physician, uh, Marie Davis, um, Annie Lynn. Annie runs many of the trials right now at the UW and uh, Terry Temkin, who you uh, many of you probably know, um, really um, has been an important figure uh, with the community. So um, that's what I have to say. And I'm now open if you, um, if you have questions or comments or anything that you wanted to talk about. Thank you, Dr. Jadev. Um, we have a somewhat shy group, so in order to get them going, I have a question for you. Um, and I won't type it in, I'll just ask it. Yeah. Um, so you brought up obsession and um, you know some of the problems that that can lead to. Um, you know, why don't, can you talk a little bit about, uh, more about some of the behavioral symptoms like perseveration and how that can impact um, you know, some of the behaviors that uh, folks have? Yeah, in the context of uh, pelvic stuff, right? Or, yeah, yeah, right. So, you know, people can say that they. Um, um, so normally, what would happen is it would say, "Hey, I need help. Uh, I'm, I'm going. I need to use the restroom," and then you'll help someone, and they just keep getting stuck on this idea that they need to use the restroom. I need to use the restroom. I need to use the restroom, and that just becomes like a mantra. I need to use the restroom. Um, and so in that way, it can be disruptive. It can also cause a caregiver to lose sense of whether or not it's actually a real problem or not. And, um, you know, these things that, that are get perseverated on are never just completely out of the blue. You know, there's some issue that, um, you know, would have maybe all of us would have taken note, but when one perseverates on it, you just get stuck on it and keep talking about that same thing. So it's a real problem. You just can't let go uh, and move on from it. And I think that's the same That's the same principle here. And so if you can get rid of the initial seed of the problem, you can help with that, um, that discomfort. But it's definitely a challenge because sometimes you just don't know, um, you know, especially if one of the symptoms we're talking about is having to use the restroom all the time Sometimes it may just be biological. And what are some of the early signs that caregivers can look out for um, in some of these problems with um, you know, diarrhea, um, urinary tract infections? So what, what can we do to help the caregiver to kind of recognize that um, they need to start talking with the care team at the centers of excellence? Yeah. So. Um, in terms of, say, the bowel, um, you know, sometimes people just don't eat as much when they have problems with bowel. And so if you notice that someone's just all of a sudden not interested in eating, remember the bowel. It may not just be appetite. It may be problems with the bowel. Um, and then, you know, frequently needing to use the restroom all of a sudden or not all of a sudden, but, um, you know, more frequently than before can be a sign of, of um, you know, someone losing proper bowel control, but sometimes they can have cramping. Um, they can feel like they, they have, um, you know, gas or, or um, that they're full. Um, and with constipation, I think it's important to just, uh, sometimes you don't keep track of how often someone goes to the restroom, but um, if, if stool is very hard, that's something else to, to keep in mind. With the bladder, um, that's such a tough one because um, I didn't really talk about this here in terms of the actual, you know, things like infection, but it's always a huge problem, particularly for people that um, have uh, cognitive or behavioral features that make it difficult to simply ask them, are you having pain when you urinate? And of course, a lot of people can't tell you that. And so um, sometimes it just manifests as a fever 
Um, sometimes it manifests as behavioral change. Um, and so then that becomes a sticky wicket because certainly if someone has a UTI, a urinary tract infection, they can have behavioral changes. They get sick, they can have a fever, and they can have a blood count that looks like they're infected. The problem is too though, you take someone to the emergency room because they have behavior problems and then they look at the urine. Sometimes people look at the urine and say, oh, there's just a urinary tract infection. So we're gonna give you some antibiotics and send you home. And often it's not really a urinary tract infection. It's just that the urine they get looks like it has some bacteria. It doesn't necessarily mean that the person's infected and has an inflammatory response. It just means that the urine is dirty, but sometimes it's difficult to, that doesn't get clarified. And so um, just as a side note, uh, a, a urinary um, a, a urinary analysis that suggests UTI isn't always completely um, the answer. Um, but so UTIs can also present with abdominal pain um, in addition to uh, fever and, and, and behavioral changes. And then a UTI can also lead to frequency needing to, to urinate frequently. Um, yeah, so those, I think those are the things that we would keep in mind and keep in mind um, for um, infection. And that's a really excellent point. So the other part about um, constipation in people with neurological diseases is that um, a lack of mobility makes you at higher risk for having constipation. And so movement is really helpful. And this is even, you know, even if you can't walk around, movement on a chair, uh, some sort of regular uh, exercise is, is important. And, you know, on a larger level, we always talk to people about, it's, it's just important to have some sort of regular exercise routine. It doesn't need to be, you know, 45 minutes running, doesn't need to be even 30 minutes on an elliptical, just walking, even walking. Um, but regularly walking is a really uh, an important piece of trying to keep your body um, at its best shape in general. And then it also helps to keep the bowels moving. Um, Wendy may have a question, it looks like. Okay, um, is the inability to control passing gas a problem? So um, that's a good question. You know, because the trouble with Huntington's disease isn't necessarily a problem at the sphincter, it's um, not necessarily something that we would expect, um, but it, it can be, you know, having a lot of gas and feeling bloated can be a feature of constipation of just not moving the, the bowels enough, moving them along. How does a unawareness affect bowel health? So that's a, a really great um, question. So, you know, that on one hand brings up the question, what is incontinence um, versus simply not being aware? And that's a, a difficult one. I think when people are, um, when we deal with these questions about bowel problems that are affecting a patient's comfort level, it's usually when people are aware enough to say, you know, because what we're doing is we're treating the patient's sensation. Um, we, uh, so that's when it's really, when it comes up for us is when people are aware and they say, hey, this is really interrupting my, my um, quality of life. Um, for people who are not as aware, um, that's when we start to think about regimens. And so we really recommend people can um, use diapers um, and, uh, not necessarily worry about trying to get people to the toilet as often as they must. Um, and with the bladder, what we recommend is just routine uh, bathroom breaks. And so um, if you're dealing with someone who you know, you know, can still use the restroom, but may not be aware of when they actually have to go, just say every two hours, we're gonna go to the restroom and you bring the person to the restroom and generally people can just go. And then that way you can avoid Send, avoid accidents or avoid un, untimed, unplanned uh, um, 
restroom breaks. Yeah, so, you know, that's a, um, so when we talk about intimacy, who's bringing it up? Uh, we have heard from caregivers um, and that sometimes is in the context of just saying that things have changed. Um, we have heard from patients who are concerned about their ability to continue. Um, often what we hear are patients that are concerned about the side effects of medications, but we definitely hear it from both sides. Um, you know, I don't want to say, so anecdotally, <laughs> we've had a, a few women who are um, concerned about, about losing that intimacy with husbands and, and, and how to um, how to maintain it. And so, you know, still planning um, time alone is important, even if it's not engaging in some activities you used to engage in. But I, both, both parties um, bring, these, bring up these issues with sex and intimacy. We had someone who um, who was so uh, he, this poor guy. He uh, he knew at the beginning of his day if it was going to be a good day or a bad day, just based upon whether or not he was able to have a bowel movement. And this really, and he was living in an adult family home at the time, and it was really challenging for his caregivers because he would get so upset about it. Um, and uh, so finally, after a number of different regimens, I think we worked on uh, different patterns of meds, um, he wrote back a while later saying, this is the best thing that ever happened. And he just just became much more happy and content and, and certainly a lot easier on caregivers as well. Diet is a, a funny thing because there's always that balance between promoting a diet and uh, letting people enjoy what they will. Um, so we haven't had um, too much trouble with having to change the diet because of bowel symptoms, um, but we do have, you know, this is a probably a, a more oft discussed issue, which is dealing with diet and that weight loss. Um, you know, we feel pretty, um, we are very liberal about what type of foods people eat at a certain point um, because of the concern about weight loss. And we have some patients that are looking for, they try and get protein shakes, et cetera. And, you know, you don't necessarily need all the protein shakes. You don't necessarily need a lot of expensive stuff either. Um, just things like um, uh, ice cream and ice cream shakes or Greek yogurt. Um, things that just have a lot of calories are perfectly okay to eat and eat a lot of because um, they need, you know, people with HD need thousands, I don't know, what's that, five or 6,000 calories a day. And so, um, so be liberal with it. And it's not as if, and, you know, we haven't had people have uh, bowel problems because of what they, um, because of any change in their diet of significance. Um, you know, things like coffee, however, are a different story. And, and in truth, that has been a problem uh, a couple of times when people have to use the restroom all the time. Um, it's been this, I can't, they cannot stop drinking coffee. And um, those are one of those sort of um, preservative obsessive behavioral things that are hard to interfere with, um, you know, switching to caffeine free, et cetera, uh, doesn't always work. But th those are ways in which sometimes you're, uh, you're working against, you're working against the, the, the patient in terms of patient's desires and, and what's uh, gonna be helpful for them. Um, and in the same way, you know, no coffee towards the nighttime. We, we generally don't, if people are drinking more than a cup or two of coffee, we try and get them to, to slow down a bit. Um, but, you know, in terms of diet in general, people are always interested in what is the best diet to have. And, and I'm not a nutritionist, 
but, uh, and this sounds like hand wavy, uh, the best diet is still a balanced diet. Now that Mediterranean diet is, is reasonable, um, but uh, there is no, um, no data to suggest like a, a protein heavy diet is necessarily beneficial. Really, it's a healthy diet. There is enough data to support that that this phrase healthy body healthy brain really is true and you know what are all the factors that contribute to it hard to know but you take animals that are given a neurodegenerative disease so these animal models of neurodegenerative disease and you make them exercise and they often um, have better symptoms than the ones that don't exercise so um, healthy diet and exercise is a good thing i don't think there's been necessarily a a trial um, of it with Huntington's disease in terms of um, those diet and exercise and, and prevention of symptoms. There has been a study in individuals that have genetic Alzheimer's disease, so not the same, but genetic to the point where they could actually look to see when people had their onset of disease and people that exercised did do better in that case. Um, but but in general, for, but in general, we just we recommend people to try and um, just pursue a healthy diet. And uh, and it may sound like I'm saying two things at the same time: healthy diet, but also okay to have a lot of ice cream. Yes. In other words, don't try and do a protein heavy diet. Uh, you don't need to go vegetarian, um, um, but it's okay to eat you know half a tub of ice cream if you're still 110 pounds but five foot eight and and losing weight. Um, Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Jadev. Um, it seems that our audience is a little shy today, but I do want to, oh, wait, we do have something coming in. Oh, I'm representing the Huskies. <laughs> That's great. So we do want to remind folks that um, this presentation has been recorded and will be available in about a week on our YouTube channel. And I'm urging everyone to review it again, because what uh, the information that Dr. Jay gave today was really unique and something that we haven't offered in the past. So it had lots and lots of new information that it was uh, that I was not aware of, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. So um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Jay Dev, for joining us today, and uh, we look forward to having you again in the future on another topic. Great, thanks, thanks a lot, everybody. Take care and have a good day. Bye bye. Bye.